Gay Brown is a pioneer in the region egg space and the soil health space. And so this video, I'm going to tell you um, his five principles for regenerating soil health um, and a little bit about Gay Brown. If you don't know who I am, I'm Teal Simmons. I help farmers transition from conventional way of farming, just like what Gay Brown was doing back in the day to a more robust and regenerative way of farming, such as what Gay Brown is doing now. If you want to work with us, go to our website. Uh, there's a link below um, and you'll find out more about how we can help you um, on your farm. Awesome. So essentially, Gabe Brown was just a conventional farmer in the States. And basically what happened was his farm got struck four years with uh, crop fails every year of those four years. And basically he was about to go bankrupt um, where he started looking into how previously, how previously soil was managed and cared for. Um, and I think a bit of um, holistic management uh, thrown in the mix there too. And essentially came up with these principles and started regenerating his soil health, leading to uh, an amazing farm. One day I'd love to visit, um, but I'm over in Australia and so a bit of a trip. But um, essentially he's able to improve his soil to such an extent that he's able to achieve 25% greater yields now th this are yields not just profit margins but yields compared to neighboring farms He's, he was able to increase his soil organic carbon or matter from uh, i think it was 1.7 to over 11 11.3 percent um, which is what 10 percent over 20 years which is an average of 0.5 percent each year um which a uh, which is an amazing job He's able to capture so much more water with this. He went from an infiltration rate of half an inch to six inches, plus all the water holding capacity that he's able to achieve with that. He's also able to make profit off his farm all year round with um, different um, crop rotations and integrating animals onto his farm. So he's, he's more resilient to all kinds of extremes, all kinds of changes on his farm. And overall, he's able to reduce inputs and make more money from um, just greater profit margins and increasing those yields. So really a true showcase of the ability for healthy soils to make uh, money now and in the future um, with, I guess, low costs. And that's all the way, that's just really the, the biggest thing with this is just cultural changes on how we treat our soil. And so I'm going to tell you exactly his five principles that he um, used to make this happen. Now it is uh, also good to note that um, Gabe Brown has a book called Dirt to Soil. I'd highly recommend uh, reading it. If you want to find a link to uh, the book, um, you can find it on our website or um, you can just order it off of Amazon. So the first principle from Gabe Brown is uh, reducing the soil disturbance. So that is both physically, so we're going to reduce tillage. What tillage does is, so say this is our soil, when we come through with our tillage implements, any really any kind of tillage, we are putting these rippers into our soil and we're really breaking up the soil uh, structure. And so what this does is it, it collapses our soils, it turns over our soil biology to release it to um, UV light and heat, which is going to kill them. It does increase aeration of our soils, but that causes our microbes to, or what, what remaining microbes there are, to really start um, degrading soil organic carbon by, um, by essentially eating them away. Also, the soil organic carbon is going to oxidize and so we're going to lose all of that. So really, tillage is very destructive to our soils. Um, and so the first thing that he would, he would say is to reduce physical disturbance of our soil by tillage. And so what, what that means is we will need to implement no-till um, or reduced till to our farms. And that's really where we just come along with a, a seeder and it makes a little little cut in our in our soil, plants the seeds and covers it over. And so the rest of the um, farm or the soil is really undisturbed. The other way to reduce soil disturbance is by reducing our inorganic chemical applications to our farms. And so we're not saying, you know, completely reduce it because if you need to add a bit of molybdenum or whatever, it's very hard to get large amounts of molybdenum um, in you know, non-organic forms. And so um, reducing, we can definitely reduce our uh, nitrogen um, inputs. Now I have a whole video on re uh, reducing nitrogen inputs on our channel, so check that out. But we're, we're gonna want to reduce that because a lot of these inorganic fertilizers or inputs really um, hurt our biology in our soil. So we can't build soil health if we're killing our 
um, soil biology. We also, uh, we also want to reduce the amount of insecticides or herbicides, pesticides, all of those, because they are all going to be destroying our soil biology as well. So once we stop those things, we can actually start building soil health because those things, they're destroying soil health. So you can't really build soil health while destroying it at the same time. So we gotta stop those um, before we can start implementing these other strategies, which build it. So the next strategy is well, to protect our soil surface. And so we can, we can do that with um, leaving a crop residue on the surface or with a cover crop. And so this is beneficial, firstly because so if we get some residue on the surface of our soil, it's going to prevent uh, any kind of erosion. So when we get uh, wind or water, or so rain, hit our um, soil, it's gonna prevent those soil particles from dislodging and then being taken away. So that's the first one that's gonna stop erosion, but it also protects our soil and our microbes from um, uh, large amounts of heat or um, UV light. And so when you think about it, light shining, all that energy in the sun is going to be hitting our soil, heating it up, uh, causing excess evaporation and um, really hurting our microbes. So we wanna make sure we get a really nice layer of say uh, crop residue. So like that's almost like a mulch. Um, as well, or, or what we could do is have a cover crop. When we do it like this, it also adds food to our um, soils for our microbes. And so when we have a crop residue, we have um, a cover crop that's gonna be feeding our microbes too. So extra benefit from that. But really, this one is to protect our soil from erosion and um, UV light and, and extra heat. Our third um, principle is to maintain living roots. Now this is so important because when we have living roots, well when we have roots in general, that's gonna be holding a lot of our soil together. And so when you think of a plant putting its roots down, that's gonna be holding the soil together. But also living roots feed our microbes in our soil. So mycorrhizal fungi, which is really important, they need a host to um, basically grow on. And so when we have a, uh, a plant that comes up, it's put, it puts its roots down. That plant will be taking sunlight and then turning that into sugars and then putting it out into our soil to feed our microbes. Now in turn, those microbes are gonna be doing heaps of functions for our soil. It's going to be building soil again carbon. It's going to be making uh, biofilms to stick our soils together. So we're building soil structure that way. They're going to be uh, mineralizing different um, uh, compounds in our soil. So making basically its own fertilizer when we have living roots in our ground. Now, the important thing about this is we want living roots all across the year. And so in a lot of systems, we basically have a fallow period over summer, which we get rid of our plants, we get rid of all the roots, and our micro, microbiome just dies. And so we want to make sure we have living roots across the whole year, across um, not just our growing season, but when, so in, in wheat, we have a period where there is no photosynthesis going on. And so there's no living roots. So we wanna make sure that we, we have living roots um, even when our cash crop is not, um, I, said, I guess, growing um, or it's drying out, but also in our fallow period. And um, when, when we're getting really good at this, even when we terminate um, the cover crop over um, our non-cash crop growing season. So making sure that we have growing roots. Now this is, some ways that we can do this is with a cover crop. So um, putting a, um, a diverse mix of plants as a cover crop, we've got a video on that, which explains all of that. Also uh, companion cropping. So say a really good example that I saw uh, the other day when I visited a farmer is they had uh, clover and they basically just, um, they grazed it and then sowed wheat straight into it. And so what that allowed was um, a, Clover's pretty low to the ground, so it's gonna allow for this really nice cover of grain over the paddock, which is going to be producing um, living roots as well as cover, but it allowed for the wheat to still come up through and then um, basically allow for the, the wheat to grow. And so that farm actually was able to achieve, um, I think it was five tons of wheat per hectare with basically no um, nitrogen inputs. Um, so that's one way of doing it as well. So cover crops and uh, intercropping. Gay Brand's fourth principle is to have biodiversity. Now, when we look at nature, we don't see a monoculture. We don't see one 
kind of species. We see a whole range of species, including different types of plants, but also uh, insects, animals, a whole range of different things. And the reason why this is important is because each species has a specific function in the ecosystem. So we're going to start thinking about these things as a ecosystem or take a systems approach. Each plant has a different profile to their root exudates, which will be feeding different microbes and all those different microbes will have different functions. Some might be um, mineralizing, some might be fighting off pathogens, some might be uh, increasing the water flow to plants. You know, there's a whole range of different functions. We have a mixed bunch of species in our farm. Gabe Brown talks about how where well, there's somewhere between 1,500 to 1,700 beneficial insects for every pest there is. And so think about all the benefits that those, you know, 1,700 different insects um, are giving us compared to um, the one pest. And also a lot of those um, beneficiary insects will be getting rid of those pests. And so when we have biodiversity, we increase our resilience to change um, both extreme changes and just usual changes in the weather as well as in the economy. And so when we have you know, um, rotating crops, different crops growing, we're not just have we're not just reliant on wheat and that's it, just wheat. And so if the wheat market takes a tumble, then we take a tumble too. If we have different enterprises on our farms, we're more resilient to whatever comes. And so biodiversity of both our um, crops that we grow, but also farm outputs that we produce. There's also a really interesting function called quorum sensing that Dr. Christine Jones talks about. And essentially once we get to a particular size of microbes in our soils um, and diversity, the microbes start to function in a, in a different way. And so they're able to change their gene expression to really increase their um, function. And so we can only get that when we have high amounts of diversity and large amounts of microbes. The last one, livestock integration is fundamental to all this and, and it really boosts the microbes in our soil and um, as well as our profits. And so the best way to integrate li uh, livestock is say you have your um, cover crop. So you've got a well diverse cover crop because we're following our fourth principle and they have all different kind of roots producing all different kind of extradites to a bunch of different microbes we want a way so we can profit off of all of this and livestock cows and sheep and, and all that um, mainly ruminating livestock they are a basically a money maker when we look at the way that they can convert this plant matter to meat, which we can then sell. And so the idea is to just graze all this, preferably holistically, um, so that we can capture all of the basically food in this, turn it into meat, and then we can sell that for a profit. Now, the amazing thing about cows is that they're um, a lawnmower on the front, so they can terminate this or do a very good job of, of um, terminating it. They produce a, a product that we can then sell, but they also produce manure, which is a perfect inoculant for microbes. And so when we think about it, the rumen is a place that's nice and um, dark, um, there's a large amount of moisture, it's warm, perfect for microbes to grow. So cows are just a massive walking fermentation tank, which um, grows these microbes, which then pass out through the back of the, the cow um, to inoculate our soils, but also to recycle the nutrition um, from it, these plants. And so not all of the nutrients from the plants are going to be, go straight into the, the cow or the livestock, or whatever. It's going to be passed out and make its own, basically inoculated fertilizer for our soil. And so that's why livestock is so important. It helps us capitalize on our cover crop and it also allows us to make our own fertilizer and inoculant. I saw a, uh, I don't think it was a study. I'm sure there's probably studies out there for it. Um, but I saw someone's example and they, they grazed their cover crop um, and then they didn't graze the cover crop, so just side-by-side -side, uh, comparisons. And there was nearly twice as much microbial um, biomass in the grazed um, section of the cover crop than compared to the non-grazed. And that's just in itself, that's a massive difference. There was um, large amounts of microbial fungi in... Uh, the grazed section and there's none in the non-grazed and so fundamental to building soil health. So there you go, there's Gay Brand's five principles for building soil health. So they are reducing soil disturbance both physically and chemically, 
protecting the soil surf surface with a um, cover crop, ideally, because we get all these other benefits, but at least um, crop residue. Maintaining living roots, which we can get through cover crops and intercropping. Biodiversity, so making sure our cover crop is diverse and that we're having rotations and integrating the livestock because we get the biodiversity as well. Plus, uh, we can capitalize off our cover crop and we can make our own fertilizer and it's an inoculant as well. And so by using all these, Gay Brown has been able to massively change his farm, both just um, the ecosystem on his farm and the profitability of his farm, which is very important. I'm very much against the idea that regenerative farms are non-profitable um, or that they're um, unproductive. Gay Brown's farm is more productive than any other farm in his area and more profitable. So, um, I don't know, take what you will from that, but um, I would definitely be sticking with these over buy this, apply this, kill everything. So, if you are an Australian grower and you want to implement these five um, principles, well, there you go. You can take them now and go apply it. But if you need help with applying those, um, contact us at Agrisol and we will help you get started and coach you through it. Awesome. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Phil Simmons from Agrisol. Uh, cheers.